Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Stephanie Monaco, and um, I am uh, here to introduce our fourth panel in a five-panel session of our Investment Management Regulatory University this year. This is our 14th. I hope our 15th will be live. It's challenging to present through this medium. It, it's like, it feels like one of the athletes or baseball player playing to an empty stadium, but we'll do the best we can for very, always a very interesting and interactive enforcement panel that we have for you today for the next hour and a half. Before I introduce the panel, uh, a couple of housekeeping uh, rules and, and information that you would want to know. One, um, please ask questions. We love to interrupt, to be interrupted, and we love to interrupt. Use the Q&A widget that is on the bottom of your screen, and we will try to address the questions through the webinar and get back to you if we're not able to do so. For those of you seeking CLE credits today, download the affirmation form and the evaluation form found in your resources widget on the screen. We will announce the CLE code once during the middle of this presentation and once again at the end. Please return both forms for CLE credit. The presentation and supplemental materials are available for download from your resources widget. We will also distribute these through email after the webinar. Uh, as I noted, this is our fourth of five panels for Investment Management University this year. The last panel will be next Wednesday at noon Eastern. That will be our ethics panel where we will talk about congressional and executive branch investigations, as well as internal investigations, and in particular those that go uh, wrong. Um, please tune in for that, and that will be our last of our five panel sessions for this year. Uh, as my preliminary uh, tendencies seem to be, I uh, I really love the philosophy of ambiguity. Those of you who have tuned in for previous ones have heard some of them. I have some others that I use from time to time because, again, if the law isn't ambigu ambiguous, uh, I don't know what is. So, for example, in the category of intriguing, ambiguous thoughts. Um, well, what was the best thing before sliced bread? And and does the little mermaid wear an algae bra? Now that's a little that's a little that was an iffy one. I wasn't sure if I was going to do that one. Or if you try to fail but succeed, which have you done? Um, why is there an expiration date on sour cream? Can an atheist get insurance against acts of God? And lastly, and this is the one I love the most because some, in some respects it applies to me, one nice thing about egotists, they don't talk about other people. So with that and some ambiguity that hopefully will be straightened out for many of you today where it comes to enforcement, I'm going to introduce our panelists for this session. I'm going to introduce all of them at one point because um, as those who have seen our presentations before where enforcement is concerned, and I don't know if it's just fundamental to litigators or not, but we do tend to interrupt each other. So I, I will give you um, an overview of our panelists, our partners today. Uh, first up will be Gina Parlavecchio. She is very new to Mayor Brown. We welcome her. She um, is a member of the Global White Collar Defense and Compliance and Regulatory and Investigations Practices. Previously, she was an assistant AUSA in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, where she served as the chief of the office's International Narcotics and Money Laundering Section. 
Um, as a federal prosecutor for more than a decade, Gina has investigated, prosecuted, and tried some of the EDNY's most complex and sensitive high-profile cases involving money laundering and Bank Secrecy Act violations, mail and wire fraud, tax fraud, uh, OFAC violations, etc. One of her um, claim to fame, shall we say, among many, is that um, she, while she tried a dozen criminal trials to verdict, uh, she was the lead trial counsel in the recent prosecution of drug kingpin El Chapo. Um, so glad she has joined us at Mayor Brown, and um, she will be covering DOJ interests in money managers. At, at next or throughout is um, is our partner Matt Kluchenik. He is a member of our banking and finance group and the derivatives and fintech practices. He has a, an extraordinarily broad financial services practice. He's a counselor. He is a defender. He is a transactional and enforcement lawyer. Um, and you all have heard from Matt before, but we're delighted that he has joined this panel. After Matt Kluchenik, not to be confused with another Matt, is Matt Rossi. He's a partner in our Washington office and co-leader of our firm's securities litigation and enforcement practice. He focuses on all aspects of security regulatory enforcement defense, with a particular emphasis on representing advisors, broker-dealers, private funds, registered funds, all of their affiliates in SEC examinations, investigations, and enforcement actions. He also routinely represents clients before FINRA and counsels clients on a variety of compliance matters. Of, of particular mention where Matt Rossi is concerned is that before joining us, he served as um, the Assistant Chief Litigation Counsel in the Division of Enforcement at the SEC, where his role was primarily investigating, litigating violations of the federal securities laws by advisors, broker-dealers, large financial institutions. He also served as Senior Counsel in the SEC's Asset Management Unit, and um, we're very thankful, Matt, that you have been here for so many years. Um, but on our side of the table, not on the SEC side. And last but not least is our partner, Richard Rosenfeld, who co-leads um, the U.S. Securities Litigation and Enforcement Practice in the United States. Um, Rich really needs no introduction. Anyone who's met him will find him unforgettable. Um, <laughs> And he, he has decades of in increasingly senior government regulatory and enforcement positions before coming to us. Um, he leads internal investigations, often advising clients on preventive compliance and remedial measures before and after securities-related issues arise. Um, one, one claim to fame that we're very proud of, and I think Rich is too, is that he at some point was asked to return to the government service from private practice in the midst of the financial crisis, the one before, if you believe one has happened now, the one before this, um, to serve as the chief investigative counsel over the TARP bailout of the U.S. financial system. And in that role, he helped build and lead a team of top white-collar securities and bank fraud specialists tasked with conducting criminal and civil investigations. And earlier in his career, he was also in the Division of Investment Management. As for me, um, I, I, in awe, and I seldom use that word, but truly in awe of um, being part of this panel with such uh, a tremendous group of partners. I'm in the Investment Management office of our firm dealing with registered advisor issues, compliance, what we refer to as cradle to the crave problems, um, having been at the SEC for um, a long time ago, shall we just leave it at that, probably before some of you were out of grade school. 
Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gina to talk about the DOJ, its interest in money managers, and other fascinating subjects. Take it away, Gina. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for that kind introduction, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about the DOJ's response to misconduct by money, man money managers and just giving a brief overview of DOJ's actions in this area over the past year. So first, I'm going to give a synopsis of some representative cases that DOJ has brought in the last year. I'll touch on some cases wrapped up this year and how they were resolved. I'll talk about one particular case to watch uh, over the remainder of 2020, and I'm going to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on DOJ's white-collar prosecution. So first, turning to some new case highlights, cases that were brought over the past year in the area of investment fraud. In this area, we mainly saw a substantial number of, you know, really garden variety investment fraud cases. DOJ continued to focus much of its prosecutorial resources and white collar cases on pursuing, pursuing criminal wrongdoing by individuals. These cases involve traditional schemes that can really be broken up into two categories. Cases where a money manager misappropriates investor funds by representing that his or her fund will invest in a certain type of vehicle, but then fails to do so and converts the victim investor's money to his own personal use or a common scheme in which the investment advisor simply falsely overinflates the stated value of an investment, which a victim investor relies upon in making their investment and ultimately causes loss to the victim investors. So turning to a few examples of these types of cases. First, you have um, the U.S. versus LaGuardia case out of the Southern District of New York that was brought in December of 2019. In this case, LaGuardia was the CEO and co-founder of a New York-based investment firm. And prosecutors allege that over the period of four years, he solicited millions of dollars of investment from investors in his fund, for his fund, LR managers, and two related feeder funds that he represented had a focus on investments in frontier markets in Latin America, Central and Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. The prosecutors allege that contrary to his representations, LaGuardia misappropriated about $1.5 million for purposes of financing his fund's payroll, rent for his offices, and hundreds of thousands of dollars in charges on the firm's credit cards. Prosecutors also allege that LaGuardia diverted about $190,000 for his own personal use. So basically the way this scheme would work was LaGuardia would instruct his investors to make a wire transfer into the LR managers fund for ultimate investment in the frontier fund, but instead of transferring the entire sum of money into the frontier fund per the investor's instructions, LaGuardia allegedly took a portion of that money and commingled it with an operating account for the LR managers and would basically use that money to pay company's expenses or his personal expenses. And for those alleged actions, prosecutors have charged wire fraud, securities fraud, and investment advisor fraud. Now turning to the category of cases where in investment managers have been alleged to have overinflated assets. We have two cases, the Ross case and the Who case, which were just charged this summer after the onset of the pandemic, um, which really shows that prosecutors' offices have gotten their feet under them and are continuing to bring cases despite uh, the remote the challenges of remote working. Now, in the Ross case, um, another case involving the founder of an investment firm, this one was called DLI. Um, and DLI actually oversaw more than $1 billion in assets under management. In this case, prosecutors allege that the scheme lasted for about six years between 2013 and 2019, and that Ross made a series of false statements that had the effect of overinflating his fund's value. Now, according to the indictment, prosecutors allege that Ross directed his company to invest the fund's assets in a company that loaned money to small businesses and retailers. The DLI fund made money when the loans performed. And prosecutors allege that rather than disclose that some of these loans weren't performing, Ross falsified monthly reports to make it appear that borrowers were making payments. But um, in actuality, the payments came from fee rebates given by the company originating the loan. Prosecutors claim that by lying about the true status of the loan, Ross caused DLI to overstate the value of these loans on the fund's books and fraudulently inflate the fund's value 
by about $300 million over the course of four years. As a result, prosecutors allege that Ross was able to collect millions of dollars in fees that he otherwise would not have been able to charge to his clients. And he has been charged, been charged in an SEC complaint as well. So that'll be a case to watch over the next year. Similarly, in the Who case, which was brought in the Southern District of New York um, over the summer in July 2020, um, we have a case where there was a little bit more of an elaborate fraud um, alleged. David Hu, uh, managing partner and the chief investment officer of a New York-based investment advisory firm called IIG, um, was charged with investment advisor fraud, securities fraud, and wire fraud offenses. In this case, prosecutors allege that over a period of more than 10 years, Hu perpetrated a $100 million scheme to defraud investors in IIG's funds including by creating fictitious investments and overvaluing investments used to generate funds to pay off earlier investors in a sort of what prosecutors term a Ponzi-like manner. Who's fund, IIG, was an SEC registered investment advisor that advertised itself as specializing in global trade financing, particularly in providing trade finance loans to small and medium-sized businesses. IIG's principal investment advisory strategy, including with respect to IAG funds, was investing in trade finance loans that it also originated. Now, in um, laying out its charges, prosecutors allege, <clears throat> excuse me, that from 2007 to 2019, who conspired with others to defraud investors in IIG managed funds by, in a variety of ways. Um, first, by overvaluing distressed loans held by the IIG funds falsifying paperwork to create a series of fake loans that were classified fraudulently as positively performing loans and to otherwise hide losses, selling overvalued and fake loans to a collateralized loan obligation trust and new private funds established and advised by IIG, and using the proceeds from those fraudulent sales to generate liquidity required to pay off earlier investors, and again, what's called a, they cross years have termed, termed a Ponzi-like manner. In this case, prosecutors charge conspiracy to commit investment fraud and securities fraud and wire fraud. Now, in addition to these garden variety fraud schemes, we also saw that insider trading cases are still alive and well in 2019 and 2020. Um, and it really has shown Gina? that, yes. Hey, this is Rich. Before you jump to insider trading, I had a question. You know, it's only because of the times we live in now, I, I haven't been able to get to New York and have a, a, a drink with you and get to talk about the fact that you recently left the government from the Eastern District of New York. And, and one thing I know I and everybody on the phone call is always really interested in is, um, is inside baseball, is what the government is thinking and how they're thinking. And before we get to insider trading, just with garden variety fraud, um, I always – say that you know the government is always in the business of fraud with this being specifically investment advisor or investment management fraud uh, you know is there um, any focus in your office have you heard you know between the the, the offices in New York City a, a discussion about investment advisors or investment managers being a, an important topic is that a kind of thing that you think is going to be you know continually ramped up we're seeing it a decent amount from the SEC, but I was curious about hearing it from the DOJ side. And since you just got out, I thought I'd ask you. Sure. So I think prosecutors are always looking at cases that will help protect the health, you know, as they see it, the health and um, of the U.S. financial markets and protecting investors. Um, I, I think over the past, especially over the past couple of years, because of the administration, I think Prosecutors are focusing their attention a lot more on individual white collar cases versus um, some bigger institutional cases, um, mainly because that's coming from the top. So I do think that there is um, an increased focus of resources on um, investment advisors just by virtue of the fact that they're focusing more on individual wrongdoing versus more institutional cases. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Um, so I'll just touch briefly on insider trading cases because I know we're going to talk about that more in this presentation. Um, but last fall, um, we saw a, a big case taken down in the Southern District of New York in October 2019. Um, and it shows that really 
you know, I know after the Newman case um, came down from the Second Circuit a few years ago, there was some speculation about what this would do to insider trading. Will we see these cases brought anymore or are prosecutors going to be more selective about it? I mean, I think what we're seeing is the cases are still continuing to be brought. And in this particular case, um, six members of a global insider trading ring that span from New York to France, the UK, Thailand, and Greece, and Switzerland, um, the prosecutors allege that a, a group of individuals, um, in, which included insiders at multiple investment banks, obtained material non-public information about publicly traded companies and provided that information, sometimes through middlemen, to securities traders who paid for that information to place timely, profitable securities trades based on the MNPI. In total, the stolen MNPI was used by securities traders to earn tens of millions of dollars in illegal profits. The Southern District of New York brought charges against the investment banking insiders, a close relative of a corporate insider, as well as securities traders who traded on that MNPI. But I think what was particularly notable about this case um, was the length to which the members of the ring went to avoid law enforcement detection. Um, they went, even went so far as to use unregistered, you know, what they call in the criminal prosecutor trade burner cell phones um, and encrypted applications to communicate, which is almost like you would expect a, a drug ring to, to communicate with one another. So that was particularly notable about that case. So um, in addition to bringing new cases, uh, numerous cases were resolved and um, reached sentencing over the past year, even despite the, the interruption with the pandemic and having to have courts move to remote ways of operating. Um, and just starting with some of the cases, the first one is a case out of my, my old district, the Eastern District of New York, which result, was resolved by guilty plea um, this past November in 2019. And um, in this case, the guilty plea resolved the charges against one of the individuals who was the lead defendant in the Beaufort Securities case. Um, and this was a, if you've not heard about it before, this is a case in which prosecutors charged Beaufort Securities, a broker dealer and investment management firm located in London that um, executed securities trades in the US on behalf of institutional investors and private clients. Um, now, Beaufort was registered in the US with the IRS under the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, um, which I'm sure as you know, requires financial institutions to identify their US customers and report information about financial accounts held by US taxpayers either directly or through a foreign entity. Now, the defendant who pled guilty back in November 2019, Kiryu um, had been employed as an investment manager with Beaufort Securities, um, which had been, and you know, the securities company had been on the government's radar for its role in a stock manipulation scheme, which was also charged in this indictment. Um, basically, what happened in the investigation is that Kiryu was ensnared in an undercover operation and was caught on tape by law enforcement agreeing to open brokerage accounts on behalf of an investor claiming to be a U.S. citizen, but the investor was actually an undercover, undercover agent. Kiryuku opened the accounts for the undercover agent in the names of various international business corporations based in Belize with Belizean nominees listed as the beneficial owners. Prosecutors allege that Kiryuku never requested the, the FATCA information from the undercover agent, even though he was required to do so. And so as a result of doing that, um, he was charged with conspiracy to defraud the U.S. Um, and this is actually the, the charge that Kiryu Ku pled, to, pled guilty to. Um, notably, the superseding indictment in this case charged a much broader scheme in which the defendant, which include, included Beaufort Securities, um, among other uh, organizations, they were alleged to have engaged in a much broader stock manipulation scheme involving a publicly traded U.S. company and with laundering proceeds through the sale of artworks. Um, but those charges were actually dismissed against Kiryu once he was sentenced um, this past May 2020. Another case that was resolved was the Elm case, which was resolved by a plea in May 2020. And this, again, is, was involved, a case involving another um, founder of an investment fund and his co-defendant, Ahmed Nafi, who is the COO of Elm Tree. In this case, prosecutors allege that they induced more than 50 investors to invest over $18 million based on the false representation that Elm and Nafi would invest that money through multiple investment funds 
and the shares of several high-profile privately held companies like Twitter, Alibaba, Uber, Square, and Pinterest before their public, initial public offerings. Prosecutors allege that Elm and Noxy told investors they were able to invest in these companies pre-IPO because of their special relationship with several venture capital firms, but in fact, those relationships didn't exist. Um, instead, Elm and Noxy were, were charged with commingling $18 million of investors' money in a single investment fund. And while they inv invested a portion of the money, I think about $7.1 million, um, with the rest of the money, they either converted it to their own use through the purchase of luxury homes and vehicles and a variety of personal items, or they used part of the money to repay earlier investors in a Ponzi-like manner. Um, what was interesting in this case is there was a four-year delay, four delay between the charges and the, and the plea um, because Elm actually fled the country after um, being charged and let out on bail. So, um, you know, the Southern District of New York was able to extradite him back to the United States and um, resolve this case. We also saw a number of sentencing this past year um, in investment advisor fraud cases. Um, the first one was U.S. v. Geraci in the Southern District of New York at the beginning of this year in 2020. In this case, Dracy was charged with conspiring to commit securities and wire fraud for causing two clients to invest in a hedge fund through his company. The government alleged here that between December 2015 and November 2016, Dracy provided fictitious account statements and updates to his victims, telling them that their investment was worth millions of dollars, when in reality, Dracy knew that the large portion of it had been stolen by the, his fund's co-founder. Eventually, Dracy liquidated his fund and misappropriated significant portions of the remaining funds, which he used to pay his own personal and business expenses. And as a result of his crimes, the court sentenced him to 24 months in prison earlier this year. And another case where we saw a sentencing this year was U.S. versus Hafen, another Southern District of New York case. Um, and this happened in February of 2020. In this case, Prosecutors have alleged that Hafen defrauded 11 of his financial advisory clients <clears throat> into believing that Hafen had access to a high-yield investment fund with guaranteed returns, um, and which were actually unaffiliated with the investment bank, bank for which Hafen worked. On Hafen's advice, these clients transferred approximately $1.6 billion directly to Hafen's personal bank account for investment in the purported investment fund over the years that Hafen had engaged in this fraudulent scheme. In the process of committing this fraud, prosecutors allege that Hafen also created fictitious investor statements um, that had the name of a non-existent investment company and purported to detail the status of the investment. But in reality, there was no investment fund. Um, Hafen was using the victim's funds to pay for his personal expenses. And as a result of his Committing those crimes in his guilty plea, the court sentenced Hafen to 30 months in prison. Now, the last case on the list is, is really an outlier. It's um, United States versus Genovese, and this um, sentence came down in February 2020. Um, it involved Genovese, who induced more than in, induced investors into investing $11.2 million in investments in a hedge fund that he founded. Um, but really, the he misrepresented his qualifications and professional background in a pretty profound manner. Um, he claimed to be a, a um, heir of the Genovese pharmacy family um, that and had been an heir and who had received money to, to use to um, start his son. He misrepresented his educational credentials, his work history, um, and he concealed the fact that he was um, a prior felon. So um, in is really an outlier. He received a pretty hefty sentence as a result of his, his crime. Um, he actually, in February of this year, he was sentenced to 140 months in federal prison for committing securities fraud. Now, turning our attention to matter, matters that have not yet happened in DOJ, but we're looking forward to on the horizon. Uh, one of those matters is the Platinum Partners Appeal. That's um, formerly known as United States versus Nordlich, um, a case that was brought in the Eastern District of New York and went to trial back in 2019. 
um, this year, the government filed its appeal in U.S. v. Nordlich, um, which had been a closely watched hedge fund case um, that went to trial in mid-2019, and the jury had returned a verdict in July of last year. This case involved the prosecution of Mark Nordlich, the co-founder of the now-defunct hedge fund Platinum Partners, and his co-defendant, David Levy, who is Platinum's invest co-investment advisor. Um, now, in July 2019, the jury had returned verdicts against Norlick and Levy for a scheme to defraud bondholders at platinum portfolio company Black Elk Energy. And while and they returned this, the guilty verdict as to that part of the scheme, but the jury had acquitted Norlick and Levy of a broader scheme that was charged. Um, and but they found that ultimately Norlick and Levy had rigged a vote to change the bond covenants of Black Elk Energy which had been Platinum's biggest investment to extract millions of dollars from the company to address liquidity issues in, in the hedge fund. However, in an unusual move, the judge in the case threw out the convictions against Nordlich and Levy post-trial and granted Nordlich and Levy's motions for a new trial. Now the government filed its appeal in January, 2020 and argued that as to Levy's conviction, the judge usurped the role of the jury by setting aside Levy's conviction and um, as to Nordlich, they said that the judge failed to consider all the evidence um, in context and that the judge essentially had, had abused his discretion. Um, now, this case is set for oral argument in November of this year, and the decision will be widely anticipated. I know prosecutors are watching it very, very closely to see how the Second Circuit handles this really unusual situation. Now, turning to the impact of COVID-19, on DOJ and its prosecution. I mean, I think the takeaway here is that COVID was really um, a brief speed bump rather than a major roadblock for DOJ. Um, just like many in the legal industry, there was a period of readjustment as U.S. attorney's offices across the country transitioned to full telework. Um, telework had been strongly discouraged uh, prior to the pandemic. So um, there was a lot of scrambling and readjustment to get the platform um, up to speed um, to, to handle so many people teleworking in DOJ. Um, but really, after people got their feet under them, with the elimination of the time necessary for witness inter to do witness interviews in person or to go to court in person um, and sit in a courtroom all day, prosecutors are really freed up to refocus their efforts on building cases. And this really especially lent itself um, to building white collar cases and what we, what we would call paper cases. Um, and, you know, prosecutions resumed. Um, federal courts adapted to doing hearings on teleconference lines and video conference. Um, and U.S. attorney's offices around the country, depending on the severity of the pandemic, were able to begin bringing back socially distanced grand juries to allow the continued investigation and charging of cases. Now, in the wake of the pandemic, um, we anticipate seeing more criminal prosecutions related to pandemic-related fraud. Um, which I know we'll, we'll speak more about in, as this presentation goes on. But, um, you know, e immediately after the pandemic hit, DOJ really didn't miss a beat in setting up a task force to pursue fraud cases related to things like personal protective equipment and price gouging. But similarly, um, you know, DOJ didn't waste any time bringing fraud charges related to the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, there was a great deal of attention in the media put on the rush manner in which the PPP program was rolled out and the fact that it could create a lot of opportunity for fraud. Um, and, you know, prosecutors are paying close attention to that. And today, the DOJ has already charged more than 50 people with fraud related to the PPP program. Now, the charges are exclusively been against individuals, um, which, you know, encompass people who Ill illegally spent PPP loan funds on themselves, or groups of individuals who coordinated to defraud the program on a massive scale. Um, but you know, I anticipate over time, the government will turn its attention toward um, institutional issues with um, corporations that had um, lapses in, in this area. I also anticipate that there will be continued focus on market volatility and how that is um, that exposes frauds that have been committed over a period of time. And I anticipate that that could um, greatly impact investment advisors. Gina, it's Rich again. Yeah. 
So uh, it, it's just that this this format isn't isn't my forte because I love to to jump in and ask things. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, you, I, I know how at, that Matt Kluchenek and, and that Matt Rossi and I will get into a little bit of how the SEC is dealing with, um, you know, not being able to do in-person testimony or interviews or, or have meetings or, or you know, hearings. Um, and and just a little bit, can you talk to the the group here uh, that? How you're seeing um, interviews be handled by DOJ? I'm curious. You know, how are they dealing with documents if they want to put anything in front of the the witness? You know, just a little bit of logistics so people can understand sort of how it was it's working if they end up uh, being a part of the process. Absolutely. So um, the government's preferred uh, platform is WebEx, um, and so they've been conducting. Um, all witness interviews almost exclusively by WebEx. I know in some parts of the, you know, this is coming from the office in Brooklyn, which was ground zero for the pandemic. So they haven't been doing anything in person. Um, but I know other parts of the country um, where maybe um, the lockdown wasn't as severe, they may be a little bit more inclined to do some things in person, uh, maybe in a, con a socially con distanced conference room situation. But the majority of witness interviews have been taking place over WebEx. And so we, we typically would have one person, one prosecutor sharing the documents over WebEx and then the other prosecutor asking questions. You know, it's not an ideal setting um, for anyone because, you know, the interpersonal dynamic is, is greatly altered. Um, I think for prosecutors, it's tougher to observe credibility. Um, but I think as, as time has gone on, they figured out ways to ensure that the um, person being interviewed is alone in the room, so they aren't sharing information. We have they they've learned how to set up breakout breakout rooms, so um, the witness can communicate with their counsel. So they're you know slowly adapting and figuring out best practices. But that's that's. Um, in a nutshell, how those interviews have been taking place. Have there been Just any to supplement that? To, oh, nope, go ahead. Go ahead. Matt. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Matt. So this is Max Lieutenant, real quickly. So uh, from my experience on the defense side, uh, we've done a number of depositions, interviews via WebEx, and a concern I've had is uh, is the ability of the witness to, frankly, look at fairly detailed exhibits on WebEx. And so what we've negotiated um, with some success here is, is having the government send us the exhibits uh, via overnight mail. Um, and then we agree that we will not open up the package uh, except on the record uh, during the WebEx presentation. So we're not getting a free look. Um, and that has, that has worked out um, pretty, pretty well. Um, so that's one one sort of alternative to trying to address the situation. That's great. I know. I think everyone is improvising in this environment and learning to evolve their best practices. I was speaking to someone who conducted a, a witness interview recently who literally had their the witness pick up their laptop and do a scan of the room to ensure that nobody else was there. Um, and so we're all we're all figuring out ways to um, ensure the the best practices for for accomplishing all of these things. Finally, just um, some quick takeaways. Um, you know, as I mentioned, most of the cases over the last year really include traditional investment schemes that that we've seen over the years. Um, there's not tons of new ground being broken here. Um, DOJ continues to focus on cases as they happen abroad and, and touch on the in the U.S., um, so they're really international in scope. Um, COVID is, well, a brief speed bump for everybody, um, has not slowed DOJ's pace, and we definitely expect to see more to come in the wake of COVID's impact on the economy. And with that, I will turn it over to Matt Kuchenik. Thanks, Gina. I, I have to say that was a really thoughtful and comprehensive presentation. Clearly, lots of issues and lots of uh, activity. Thanks much. Hello, everyone. Welcome to everyone in the audience. And want to give a, a big thanks to Stephanie for putting together this wonderful program uh, again this year. So I'm going to touch on some CFTC enforcement developments. And I think I said, I'm pretty sure I said last year during uh, the IMU that commodities enforcement was on fire. 
And I think I can say uh, without equivocation, again, this year, um, commodities enforcement for good or for bad remains on fire. And um, on this slide here really would be, I think, exhibit A to my remark, um, relatively recent testimony of CFTC chairman to Congress in which um, the CFTC, or CFTC chairman talks about more enforcement actions, more penalties, more large-scale matters, more accountability, more partnering with criminal law enforcement, which we'll talk a bit uh, about, as well as, uh, and I would add, significantly more whistleblower uh, referrals and awards. Um, and so, um, again, commodities enforcement remains very, very hot. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit generally about the CFTC exchange enforcement capabilities and then, and then get into the meat of the presentation, which is uh, some trends, some alerts. I talked about some of these last year, so it's an evolving trends, if you will. We'll expand on uh, some ones we discussed last year as well as some new ones. Uh, Takeaway from the next slide here uh, is probably that which is at the bottom there and in red. This might be Exhibit B. Uh, with respect to commodities enforcement remaining on fire, um, significant increase in um, civil monetary penalties imposed by the CFTC over the last year. That focuses on uh, uh, dollars, which are up almost 40%, but we've also seen in tandem significantly more imposition of sanctions in terms of uh, suspensions or uh, expulsions from the industry as well as more restitution and more disgorgement. Um, as some of you may know, a division of enforcement within the CFTC is one of the largest divisions. Uh, lots of lawyers, lots of non-lawyers, surveillance experts, um, economists, they really bring together a, a holistic team in terms of uh, the nature of their investigations. Uh, the exchanges, um, similarly, really robust. Uh, enforcement investigation units. They usually are called market regulation departments. Uh, lots of individuals uh, uh, operate separately uh, to avoid conflict, conflicts of interest from, uh, from the for-profit uh, exchanges. And uh, once again, uh, very, very active in terms of investigations and bringing cases. We also have the National Futures Association that of course applies um, to, uh, to CFTC registrants, which are required to be members of, of the NFA. And of all the regulators we're going to talk about, the NFA is probably the, has been the most quiet, um, with the other ones, again, uh, far and away more, more active. Uh, last but certainly not least, um, you probably get a sense of this after uh, Gina's remarks, DOJ um, continues to be uh, very, very active with respect to commodities enforcement, uh, more so than last year, more so than two years ago, and um, you, we'll see where things head. Right now, as we, we sit here literally at this moment, um, a jury in Chicago, Illinois, is in deliberations in a commodities enforcement case called the U.S. versus Borley and Chinu. It involves two big bank uh, former big bank traders who allegedly engaged in spoofing, uh, which gave rise to a, uh, a charge, an indictment by the DOJ, and this is Maine Justice out of Washington, D.C., uh, for engaging in wire fraud. It was about a one-week hearing. Um, yes, they, they actually got together in this COVID environment, 12 jurors. Um, interestingly enough, three of those jurors ultimately were excused because of potential concerns relating to, uh, to, uh, to COVID infections. Um, so um, currently there's 11 jurors in deliberation about whether or not these two, these two traders uh, engaged in, in wire fraud by virtue of uh, placing uh, spoofed orders or essentially bogus uh, non bona fide orders in the marketplace. Uh, DOJ remains. Matt, yes, yes. It's rich. It's rich, of course. Of course. Uh, I, uh, I I was fascinated to listen uh, in, and I think the folks out here. And I don't want to take too long on this. Uh, sure. It's a little bit of esoterica. But when you and Gina were talking as we were preparing for this about what you'd seen in the courtroom, uh, you know that you were actually there. Can you you know give thirty seconds on what it looked like, how the jurors sat? I mean, I found it absolutely fascinating. It's 
very much not what I, you know, what I think of when I think of Twelve Angry Men or uh, or any <sighs> depiction in a movie of a courtroom. And I thought that folks on the on the line would be interested in just a little bit of, uh, although this isn't necessarily the law, but a little detail of how the court's handling this right now. Yeah, great question, Rich. And uh, you know, to be honest, it's it's a bit surreal because. Uh, for those of you who have been in court in a courtroom and for those of you who have not, we all are generally familiar, I think, with the, the jury box, right, where you'll have 12 individuals sit almost shoulder to shoulder. And so because of uh, social distancing requirements, um, jurors have to be spaced out. And essentially what the in the federal courthouse, what they've done is allocated an entire one half of the courtroom. Uh, for the jurors. So you have jurors, you have something like two jurors in the juror box, and they're about eight feet apart. But then you have jurors spaced all the way to the back of the room and all the way to, frankly, to the door where you enter into the courtroom. So, you know, the notion uh, when you're doing a direct testimony, you would always want to tell your witness, you know, don't look at the questioner, address the jury. Now, obviously, really hard to do when they're separated by, you know, 40 feet, 40 by 20 feet. Um, so very, very difficult. You've got the defense lawyers and the prosecutors kind of all scrunched together in one quarter on the other side of the room. And then you've got, um, and then you've got a small area, um, some pews for the, for the visitors. And there's just some odd things like, for example, sidebars, right? So there's an objection. Um, uh, judge says sidebar or, or, or one of the, uh, one of the counsels. And rather than seeing that sort of familiar huddling of attorneys with the judge, everybody puts on a, a microphone, um, there's static uh, that is played uh, um, for everybody else, so we can't hear what people are saying into uh, the, the microphones on the headphones. And that happens fairly often. It's really distracting, um, but uh, it's just part, part, of the, part of the new environment. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see how this turns out. To my knowledge, I believe there's only been three jury trials now in the Northern District of Illinois in federal court. Um, so they're still kind of figuring things out on the fly, if you will. Um, but um, going to be interesting to see again how all this pans out. Amazing. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Gina. Let's touch sorry. on some. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just one more question. Um, just Briefly, did you get a sense of the attitudes of the jurors who are showing up? Are they more pro-defense, pro-government? Were you able to get a sense of that? So, so my takeaway would be, Gina, uh, always difficult to say, right, pro, pro-defense and uh, or pro-government, especially given the, the seating arrangement. So can't look at the jury box, can't like see all their faces and expressions. Um, because here, just given the spacing, really, really just difficult to even read or see expressions. But um, it did appear to me um, that at least, um, at least a few of them appeared as though they did not want to be there, <laughs> perhaps for obvious reasons. Um, and, and even that aspect alone, and Gina, you could speak more about this, but that's got to factor into, you know, how things ultimately will play out if, if jurors are frankly in a relative rush to to get on with things. And a judge who also is very mindful of the added imposition on jurors to keep things moving along. And uh, Gina, you'd have more experience in that respect. And if you want, feel free, of course, to touch on that. But it it seems to me that that's going to be an important dynamic. Oh, definitely. And especially in complex cases like this, um, you know, you always want the jurors to take plenty of time with the evidence. And so, that, that is something that, that everyone will have to take into consideration and whether to push these cases to trial during COVID. Right, right. Gina, as a, as a guy who's prosecuted a bunch of cases, I can't even imagine not speaking sort of to that jury box and trying to speak to a wall that's 40 feet long and touch every juror um, in different parts of what I'm doing. I find that such an interesting dynamic that I think would be really hard. Oh, absolutely. Especially for closing arguments. I'm sorry. Yep. Oh, d- uh, definitely. Because when you're, when, you know, as a prosecutor, you're weaving, weaving all the facts together and you can't really see how it's landing if you're turning from one corner of the courtroom to the next. I, I just right. can't even imagine how difficult that must be. Yeah. It's an amazing new, new, de- new day. <laughs> new definitely. day is right. 
Well, well great questions. Um, okay, so um, the next couple of slides identify various enforcement trends, things I call alerts, observations. Uh, I'll touch on a few of these, not all of these. Um, you know, the first one there, which really we just talked about with this federal trial in Chicago, but the idea here is it, it seems like uh, with respect to almost any type of wrongdoing outside of, you know, reporting and record keeping, uh, there's a consideration by the regulators, uh, the civil regulators, as to whether or not they can use their relatively broad anti-fraud authority um, to bring a charge uh, for fraud, manipulation, disruptive trading practices. We've seen definitions of manipulation and disruption just continually expand. Um, the CFTC has been uh, successful in terms of obtaining uh, significant, meaningful consent orders, and so no surprise when that happens to see the envelope being pushed. Um, block trades, you know, block trades um, are have become, uh, to some extent, have always been a popular way to transact in futures contracts, and block trades are really, in a nutshell, off exchange, bilateral, prearranged. Uh, negotiated um, uh, blocks or bunches of futures trades. So they're bilaterally negotiated, the parties agree to a price, and then they submit that to the exchange. This is in contrast to uh, you know, clicking a button uh, or firing an algorithm that actually transacts uh, real time in an exchange market. And so block trades, particularly amongst institutions, a lot of fund managers have become very popular. Um, and perhaps as a, as a result of that, there's been a significant increase in enforcement actions around how these things are priced, uh, how they're reported, even how they're negotiated, uh, whether a certain practice called pre-hedging uh, occurs, and there's a lot of details, and so this has become uh, a bit of a minefield. Uh, the next one, individual accountability. We talked about this last year, continues to reign supreme. Really, really big deal here. Um, I would say, at least in the context of commodities enforcement, there continues to be a focus on large names, of medium names, and small names. And so, entities uh, are not certainly not being left um, out of the uh, out of the equation. But identifying the relevant individuals and bringing actions against uh, those persons remains a paramount consideration for the regulators. We've also seen, and this is particularly, I mean, uh, since we spoke last year, a large, large number of enforcement actions by the CFTC um, centered on swap dealer conduct and swaps more generally, and particularly in the context of business conduct practices. Things around what's being disclosed to customers, is it done properly, is it done comprehensively, is it done in a misleading fashion? so on and so forth. And so we've seen dozens um, of, uh, of such enforcement actions, and there are many, many, many more investigations in the pipeline. Spot market enforcement, the, the CFTC continues to seek to brand itself as the cryptocurrency enforcer, along with the SEC and some others. But the CFTC has not been shy in terms of using its anti-fraud authority uh, with respect to spot commodity transactions. So for example, if there is a uh, Rich and I enter into uh, a, a bilateral Bitcoin transaction, and if there's a misleading uh, aspect to it, um, then the CFTC can and has shown a willingness to bring an enforcement action with respect to such conduct. Um, uh, the role of self-reporting and cooperation continues to be really important in terms of the calculus. Um, if you identify wrongdoing, um, it's really, really important that an assessment about whether to self-report it is made early on. Um, if it occurs after, after the regulator uh, finds out about it um, or is perhaps notified by a whistleblower, I'm uh, just not going to have anything close to the uh, uh, potentially beneficial impact than if it's um, self-reported to the agency without without the agency having any knowledge whatsoever. Matt, um, I know yes. you and I discussed this last year at this <laughs> at IAU. Yeah. Spend at least a little bit of time discussing it again uh, this year. 
because I've had another matter, um, and I brought up one last year, I've had another matter where an individual uh, committed fraud by inflating numbers in uh, in the systems of a, of a broker dealer. So, admittedly, a little bit different um, of a broker dealer in which it inflated his own bonus. Um, it was caught on a Friday. The broker dealer terminated the individual before he walked in on Monday. Had fixed everything. Took a two and a half million dollar hit, um, and had self-reported by Monday afternoon to Finra. Um, that that was uh, that that had happened, um, and the the individual who was terminated, of course, brought an arbitration um, and uh, whistle blew to Finra that it was wrongfully terminated. Finra began and is in the midst of an investigation against the the entity. Um, which I find appalling, <laughs> and, um, and eventually, you know, we are in the midst of, of rising it up the chain, and, and I think we will get there, and they will turn their their guns back in the right direction. Um, and remember, I'm a defense attorney, so everything I just said is how we view the matter, but I feel pretty confident in it. Um, but that's a case where you know, they, without speaking to counsel, but I think you know, very understandably, felt that that was something they needed to report to their primary regulator and were shocked to find that they did that and and almost immediately had an investigation into themselves um, and were, you know, and were and remain fairly unhappy about that. Um, There's a risk there. And I just want, I know you uh, on the other side of that, and you talked about it last year, have had some great success with early uh, self-reporting and cooperation. And I wanted to sort of throw that out there and let you juxtapose that a little bit on, on some of the um, actual self-reporting or, you know, a, a, real, a real live self-reporting issue that you've had. I know there's a couple that you've had where you've had great success, and I thought that might illum- be illuminating for folks a little bit. But, sure. but Matt, you know, before, Rich, before, yeah. well, Matt, maybe before you just juxtapose, um, <laughs> I hope that's lawful. Uh, before you do that, I just want to chime in myself. Um, I, I generally frown upon self-reporting. I, I'm sorry, but after so many years of doing it, while, while our batting average is pretty good and the SEC, self-reporting to the SEC has more or less um, had good results, I, I, I just don't trust the process. However, we're aware of a case that is is going to come out. Um, lots of cases come out on September 30th, uh, the end of the SEC's fiscal year, and um, a bunch are about to be released. One of which we're aware of, where there was self-reporting, disgorgement was involved, but there was zero, no fine imposed. And in fact, this kind of um, reiteration of um, the SEC's appreciation and how they handle situations where there's um, self-disclosure to the SEC was reiterated by Stephanie Avankian last week when um, she made some interesting remarks on the Division of Enforcement. She is co-director of enforcement, and she reiterated that uh, their process now seems to be if you self-report, um, they largely are inclined not to impose fines. That's a big deal if it's true. That's a yeah, big I mean, deal I think if that's, it's true. That's that's the major issue. I, I actually greatly respect Stephanie. You know, Matt and I have been in front of her many times. I think she's very smart, very thoughtful. And, and was a defense attorney for many years. So it does, along with her, her co, um, soon-to-be ex-co uh, head of enforcement, I, I think they they are very thoughtful, and I would love to hear that that's true, Sammy, I, I, and, and filtering down, because I think that's the way it should be. I just don't think that's the way it's always uh, played out. And that was sort of what I was talking to Mac Lucenic about, because I think he's had some great success uh, doing it as well. And that's Something that you have to think of, as Matt is pointing out, very carefully. I think. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean I, you yeah. know. Please well, I was just going to make. I, I was just going to make a snide remark that, you know, the SEC when they make their speeches, they take a couple pages out of some of the respondents on their uh, on on the cases that they 
pursue. And I note that in her speech, she provides statistics. Normally, it would be on an annualized basis now that we're approaching the end of the SEC's fiscal year. But instead, she kind of shaded things and decided to provide statistics based on the entire tenure of Jay Clayton's chairmanship. So, you know, she's a little slick too, but, and, and I have to remain um, clearly a, a doubting Thomas where, you know, it, it, is, it is reminiscent of the old expression, you know, we're the government and we're here to help you. Who buys that stuff? Who believes that really? Now, yeah. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, no, <laughs> all good stuff. I mean, I, so I think it does cut both ways. But I and you know um, yes uh, have had some we've on behalf of clients we've made some some self reports um, on a number of matters uh, for which no disciplinary action was taken. Uh, we've also made some self reports um, uh, where disciplinary action was ultimately taken. Um, but it was, we believed, um, involved a significantly reduced sanction. Um, and then I can think of one where there was a self-report um, where the client, uh, nor I, was particularly happy given, given the sanction. And I just think it really, the, the, the key here is um, appreciating, clients appreciating, uh, whether or not, and I'll just put it very simply, whether, whether all the ducks are lined up. You know, you've got to have all the components of meaningful cooperation, which in my mind is self-reporting, it's uh, meaningful corrective actions, remediation steps, and it's a willingness to cooperate throughout the process to, um, you know, to sit for testimony, to produce documents and do things that might be, might be difficult to do. And that just is, a, to me, a, has to be a really uh, thorough and thoughtful assessment. And in the absence of all that stuff lining up, I think there's, you know, at least in the in the commodity space, uh, you know, I think one would be right to uh, to be uh, to have concerns about, you know, going forward with the self report. Um, so so again, a little bit elusive, but just kind of analyzing what do we have to work with here. And as I said last year, timing, meanwhile, is all important, especially with the, you know, the increase in whistleblower actions. So if you're going to do this, you need to do it very quickly. Uh, but it's, there's a lot of considerations. Um, and so, uh, and there's certainly, as we all know, there's, there's no guarantee of an outcome on one particular matter where we did a self-report. I actually sort of um, negotiated the outcome before making a formal self-report and disclosing the client's name, and that worked out pretty well. Um, and so we established uh, what the cooperation credit would look like if, um, if you know, certain, uh, certain things happened in terms of cooperation and certain representations could be made. Um, so... Um, so there's lots to talk about. We could do a panel on cooperation, especially if we bring in the DOJ, um, but it uh, continues to be a really, really important topic. On this slide here, just one more thing to emphasize, coordination with other federal agencies and SROs. You know, we know um, DOJ receives a fair number of referrals from the CFTC. We know the CFTC gets a fair number of referrals from the exchanges. Uh, we also know that there's, uh, at least I've seen, incre increased cooperation between the securities and commodities regulators. I've seen increasingly um, a, uh, an examination, for example, by FINRA uh, with respect to uh, perhaps it's a duly registered CFTC SEC registrant or FINRA registrant, um, or maybe it's just registered with FINRA as a broker dealer. It's not registered with the CFTC. Uh, but FINRA comes across some commodities-related activity, and lo and behold, that has ended up in the hands of the CFTC Division of Enforcement. And I've seen that more times in the past year than I, than I have in the, the last 10 years combined. Hey, Matt, um, before another, I go to the next screen, please, yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal your thunder only because I don't think we're going to talk about it next. You had right before that, you had piling on also. Yes. Um, and just to add what you just said, we have a... 
a matter um, which we're going to talk about MNPI and insider trading, and it's been touched on already. And in the matter, it was, of course, a re fairly routine FINRA, or FINRA inquiry that turned into not hearing from FINRA for just a little bit, and then suddenly uh, an SEC inquiry, and then not hearing from the SEC for a little bit, and then suddenly an introduction for, to the DOJ. Uh, I think there you go. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if the states come in. You know, I think that there is an increasing, um, I don't know, you know, piling on in these uh, in these particular cases. And so I just wanted to dovetail to exactly what you were just saying that um, you know the CFTC showing up doesn't surprise me in any way, shape, or form. Exactly right. You know, and that first uh, number nine on the next slide here, cross border enforcement, really ties into that as well because we're seeing uh, an increase in uh, cooperation and referrals, particularly between the CFTC um, and the the uh, FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. Um, and, um, you know, we could also sort of check the box with respect to piling on there because uh, you, you ultimately have uh, both agencies seeking information about conduct. And, um, and then if you add on the DOJ, the NFA, um, and the exchanges potentially, uh, there's a, a lot brought to bear there by the regulators. Um, last one on this slide for, for purposes of timing, just want to touch on is, um, and we haven't talked about it yet, but it's a, it's a huge factor, um, and that's the outcome of the election and what that will mean in terms of priorities um, from an enforcement perspective. You know, none of us have a crystal ball here. I can't tell you the priorities are going to be this, that, or whatever it may be, but I feel confident priorities will change if there is a change in the administration, uh, which um, typically means there will be a change in the uh, um, the, the, the chairmanship of the CFTC, as well as a number, if not all, of the division directors. Uh, new people bring new focuses, new priorities. And, um, and I think from our perspective, um, it's just trying to keep uh, closely monitor what's happening, who's involved, um, and, and where we think uh, things are headed, um, you know, uh, if there is a change in administration as well as, as, well as personnel. So happy to address any questions, um, and if none, I will uh, turn it over to my partner, Matt Rossi. I'm now going to uh, pass this on to Matt and Rich, but um, I just want to just make a couple of very quick observations um, connecting the dots, Matt Kluchenik, to uh, the CFTC in terms of priorities and the SEC. I made note of Stephanie Avakian's speech last week. Um, just to be more specific, of course, she's she's boasting, um, uh, uh, predicting a banner year, a uh, record year when it comes to the amount of financial remedies obtained. Of course, the way she defines a year really goes back to Jay Clayton's um, uh, assuming the chairmanship, which I think is more than a year. Um, never mind. In a recent speech, she also said that there's sharp focus on financial fraud and issuer disclosure, misconduct by registrants negatively impacting market integrity, insider trading, the FCPA, Ponzi schemes and offering frauds, and they're also focused on initial coin offerings. So uh, Matt Kluchenik, I, I find the SEC's enforcement division seems to be um, sucking down the same Kool-Aid as the CFTC's enforcement division. Um, another parallel that I think is true, but perhaps not so bad, I hope not, is um, the, the point you were making about individual accountability. Um, you know, there were always threats under Mary Jo White that they were going to nail hides to the wall, i.e. Um, hold individuals accountable in order to get everyone's attention. Um, I think that was more bark than bite. This uh, particular SEC, I don't think, has done a lot of that. But um, on on September 17th, so last week, they brought this case against Gilder Gagnon, and um, they banned the CCO uh, from engaging in the, our line of business, I think, kind of forever, although I guess she can reapply at a later date. but. 
um, very sort of egregious behavior on her part where they promised to do some testing. She didn't do it. The compliance office didn't do it. Um, yet when the SEC came in, she kind of fabricated and made, made some tests up. So um, in case anybody has any doubts, that's, that's not really going to go over well with the regulators, and they would hold a person doing that individually accountable. But Matt, um, what else is interesting? Well, I, there's there's a number of different things. And I think, Steph, to your point about um, charging individuals, in my experience, they always make noises about that and rarely do it. But uh, you know, the case you just described will always get an individual charged if you're providing knowingly false information to to the SEC or falsifying documents. That that always is enough, um, and that's conduct that's easy tied to an individual. Typically, um, other areas that I, I think the SEC is is going to be interested in, uh, in addition to what we've talked about already. Um, you know, can be found in in a, a risk alert that OC provided, uh, laying out efficiencies that they saw among managers to uh, private private fund advisors uh, and managers to private funds. OC is always, the exams are always a rich source of referrals. And the exam staff says that the, the this particular risk alert uh, is intended to provide private fund ex advisors with guidance in reviewing their compliance programs, but it also provides something of a roadmap of the kind of enforcement cases that the SEC is going to be looking into. Those topics that are mentioned in the risk alert include conflicts of interest, fees and expenses, and policies and procedures relating to material non-public information. And I've got a couple of examples of those kinds of cases and also a few others like performance advertising and use of solicitors that the SEC has brought recently that I think are the kinds of things that enforcement is going to be looking at. Hey, Some Matt, of these issues it's Rick. are, yeah, Rich. Be, before we go into there, you know, and, and I think we, it's obviously our first slide that uh, is up on the screen. I, I, I think just adding in a couple of things, you know, obviously insider trading and fraud is always something the SEC is going to look at. But the one last thing, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, so I don't want to go very deeply into it, that everyone should be aware of is, Outside of those alerts, everyone, the CFTC, the SEC, DOJ, have all stated publicly, and I think they have to, that anything related to stimulus, anyone who took money, anyone who applied, any financial institution who assisted with the process is going to be under a pretty high level of scrutiny. And that's certainly there, you know, as Gina discussed when she was speaking, they're picking off, DOJ is picking off the low-hanging fruit, people who created completely fraudulent companies and went and grabbed, you know, a bailout for their employees that don't exist, those are cases we're seeing already, and those are the easy, uh, the easy ones that they should be doing. Please don't get me wrong. Just because they're easy doesn't mean they shouldn't be doing them. But I think that this, if, if the past is prologue, and it is, um, we're going to learn a lot from the last bailout uh, where I was overseeing TARP, and it, I think each aspect of the process is going to get scrutinized, and that's going to be a fairly a considerable amount of cases coming forward as well. So I just wanted to throw that into Steph's question and then let you go on to private fund marketing, uh, manager marketing cases. Well, sure. and, and like yeah. you said, Rich, you know, you know, the past is prologue. We've had these extraordinarily volatile markets, and it's affecting the performance that is being used by marketers, particularly of active managers, in a mass kind of creative, artificial way. Um, for example, here's what our performance would have looked like had the pandemic not occurred. <laughs> well, you know, you've got to market stunning. yourself somehow. Steph. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, I think all good points and the stimulus issues we're going to get into in, in just a minute. Um, but some of the other issues that I think enforcement is going to be looking at uh, are illustrated by uh, a tale of two Cetera's, two cases involving Cetera, invest, one involving Cetera investment advisors in Illinois, and another involving Cetera advisors in Colorado. Uh, Cetera investment advisors was charged with violating the cash solicitation rule 20643 which generally prohibits registered investment advisors from paying solicitors a cash fee 
for solicitation activities unless, among other things, the solicitor furnishes a written disclosure identifying the advisor and the solicitor, describing the nature of the relationship, and specifying uh, the terms of the, the solicitation arrangement, including the compensation. And at the end of last year, the SEC brought an action against Cetera for violating that rule. Uh, Cetera's predecessor paid cash fees to hundreds of banks to solicit in, uh, investors as clients for Cetera without uh, the required disclosures in writing or even orally providing the information that's required by the rule. During an exam, the staff pointed out the deficiency. Cetera's predecessor insisted that it, it didn't need to do that. Uh, the exam staff took issue with that, uh, and Cetera, Cetera's predecessor made minor changes, like including in its investment advisory agreement a statement that it shared fees with the bank, but without stating that it was for solicitation activities. Cetera then acquired its predecessor. The exam staff showed up, pointed out the same deficiencies. Cetera still didn't fix it, uh, so it got a visit from enforcement. And enforcement charged it with um, violations of 20643 uh, for failing to, to comply with the rule. And I think that's something that the SEC is always going to be looking at. And they, they see violations of the cash solicitation rule uh, as essentially a, a, a conflict of interest and a fraud on, on prospective clients who may think they're getting you know, a disinterested referral from a solicitor when, in fact, uh, it's a it's a it's a conflicted recommendation from the solicitor because they're receiving cash from uh, from the advisor, and I think they're going to continue to be focused on that even if the the uh, proposed amendments to the rule are adopted, uh, which it sort of expands the reach of the rule to cover other forms of compensation, not just cash. Although in other respects allows the disclosure to be made by the advisor rather than directly by the solicitor, as is currently required now. Uh, performance advertising is another one. The old Ironsides case, energy case was brought recently. Uh, they paid a, a $1 million uh, in penalties for using marketing materials that contained a misleading track record. The fund itself, um, advised by Ironsides, stated that it would invest in direct drilling investments and standalone private equity investments, but would not invest in other private funds. At the same time, in the marketing materials, Old Ironsides provided a track record for its principals with their past management of portfolios at, at a, a prior firm. That track record included in it private fund investments, exactly the kind of investments that the current fund was not going to use and didn't adequately disclose or didn't disclose at all that difference. It simply reflected the private fund investments as a uh, direct drilling investment of the type the current fund was going to make, and that made a significant difference to the reported performance in the in the track record. As a result, the SEC found they violated Rule 20641, prohibiting the use of advertising containing untrue statements of material facts or omissions. The firm was also charged with violating 20647 for having an inadequate compliance program with respect to preventing misleading advertising. Uh, so that's another case. I also skipped over the second um, second Cetera case, which I'll mention just very briefly. That's the case that was a different Cetera advisor, and that case involved placing clients in mutual fund share classes that paid 12B1 fees when they, the, the clients qualified for share classes that had no 12B1 fees. At the same time, Cetera also shared received revenue and, and service fees from its clearing broker on certain mutual funds, which created an incentive for Cetera to use that clearing broker and put clients in those funds, again, without any disclosure to the to the client. Um, it also directed Matt, its clearing Matt, broker to mark up certain fees. Yep. Matt, I just wanted yep. to ask, I mean, connecting the dots again, you know, uh, inappropriate share class cases have been um, kind of consistently brought for the past couple years. I think last year or the year before we talked about the 78 share class cases during that period when enforcement said, come forward and we won't impo impose clients. Of course, uh, that has 
expired. So what do you think? I mean, uh, you know, all three of us, you, Rich, Matt, I, have um, differing views on self-reporting. And I'm just, I, I, I'm concerned, given the Satera case, uh, what if we came across, what if a client currently has a share class problem, um, given the fact that the uh, the nice period is over, um, they invited people to come forward, what if you're just discovering it now? Is that a, a circumstance for self-reporting? Are, are we too doubtful about the bona fides of the staff saying, we'll go easy on you if you self-report? in the particular area involving inappropriate share class and share class problems. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that are, are these. I think uh, it's a very fact-dependent decision. Uh, it, in certain circumstances, depending on why it wasn't discovered earlier, when the problem was created, those kinds of things, you would want to take into account in deciding whether to self-report something like this. I generally am not a big fan of uh, of self-reporting, and it requires thinking about sort of what the story is going to be to the staff for why this wasn't discovered in time, why it occurred, but also factoring in sort of what is what are the risks that it's going to be detected. And I, you know, I think the the share class cases is something that OC is looking at a lot now. And the, the odds of having that discovered in an exam are high, which would, I, in my view, weigh in favor of self-disclosure. But again, it's, it's a very fact-dependent um, decision. I do think you're likely to get something in this context for self-reporting, although you should expect that you would have to disgorge all of the fees. Um, and it's a question of what the penalty would be like. Um, and you probably would get, I think, with the current staff, I think there's a reasonable chance, uh, not a guarantee, a reasonable chance you could get at least a somewhat lower penalty than you might otherwise get. Um, but I also think, as, as, as Rich pointed out, the two heads of enforcement have long experience as defense attorneys. And we've had good success sitting down and talking with them in certain cases, getting them to see things from a defense point of view, or at least understanding that, and more receptive defense arguments than certain defense arguments than uh, directors in the past. And so I, I would feel a little bit more optimistic of getting some kind of a, a break in the right kind of case um, from the current administration than of, of the enforcement division than in past years. I don't know, Rick, do you have a you yeah. view? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I think that one of the <laughs> things we... Uh, one of the things we, we talked about at the time, and Stephanie, I know you talked about this with us as well, was that you're almost certainly going to get a case, right? If you self-reported, even though you would get, uh, we thought, you know, much lower um, issue or penalty or, or whatever it may be, that you would have to disgorge fees. We all agreed on that. But most of the clients that even might have had an issue were planning to do that or were already doing that. It was more of a question of, of you know, having the negative um, press of, of having the you know the case be brought against you, especially in circumstances where we didn't necessarily see the enforcement division coming on a, the set of facts we had before us, and so that became a real, as you say, fact-intensive balancing act. Um, but you know, and, and that I think is something else that we considered at the time. But to bring it present, you know, I, th there's a client of ours that we um, that, that we counseled them just this way. They didn't self-report. Um, they had an issue, but it wasn't truly one that we think enforcement would necessarily pick up. It was very small. It was cleaned up. Um, and it wasn't necessarily even in the things that enforcement was giving uh, the program for, the amnesty for. And so in many ways, it made no sense for them to self-report. All that said, um, several uh, management level employees, every time any announcement, new case, new OC <laughs> um, review of of, uh, of this fee, of, of, of this fee issue comes up, uh, writes a, an email to the legal department, and I hear every time on almost at every couple of week basis, you know, what's happening in this area? You know, is it still right that we didn't self-report? <laughs> Should we consider anything? Oh my God! Um, it is a big. 
it's a big deal, and it's a, you know something that's still on the minds of of our clients today. Um, I'm still convinced that it was absolutely the right thing to do, and they're in the good, and they're in a good spot. And I think their legal department knows that. Um, but it's not an easy thing. And Steph, you bring up a really good point that this is something that is is fact intensive, and you have to spend time making a decision you think is right. Yeah, and um, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you got four minutes to get through four slides and then give me the final say. I'm sorry, we you guys are getting a little short sheeted. Go for it. <laughs> That's right, Matt Rick. Can, do you want to? Do you want to jump to? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to jump to the next. Work? Yeah, I'm going to jump to the next slide, and I'm going to do this really fast. Uh, OC Finra came out with a regulatory notice. Um, in many ways, that's for broker-dealers, but in many ways, those are all things everyone on this phone call should be considering. Um, I will say Matt threw down, I don't have time to have fun with the fact that I had no idea Matt was going to throw down the gauntlet of great literature by using a tale of two satiras. Um And I have all these thoughts uh, just off the top of my head with, you know, uh, Oliver Twisty continuity plans or, um, you know, the, the you know, Huckleberry financial fraud. But we could do so many, so many of those that we won't be able to get to today. What we're going to have to tell you instead is just what you need to know. The things you need to know are on this slide. These are the things that FINRA is saying you need to be taking a great look at. Remember, your business continuity plan was intended probably to be on an off-site spot where you all got together just like you did in the office. Um, look for adequate budget. FINRA certainly and the SEC are both saying out loud there needs to be greater technology, cybersecurity because we're all remote, confidentiality concerns, we're all remote. Remember your client's confidentiality. Um, increased meetings, increased chat rooms, increased ability to get feedback, analysis. Make sure you are pre-screening and supervising all of the things that don't change from what you've done but are heightened now because things are happening remotely. And you have to consider the risks that come from a remote environment. We're seeing a fair amount of folks who are talking to clients on their own because they're home and they, it's easy for them to do it on a phone, on their own phone. Uh, it's easy for them to do over a, a, a Zoom call. Uh, and, and at times, compliance really just has no idea um, what's happening or what's out there, and that can't be the case. So these are all, I think, challenges you know, but all things that you need to have in the front of your mind um, for remote work. We touched on already, I went to the next slide, um, stimulus fraud, and I don't want to go too greatly into that, um, but basically the government is going to have increased and intensive scrutiny. Three separate independent oversight bodies have been created by the Act itself. Um, cares, and, and, and I think that that's, uh, one is just like SIGTARP that I headed, and the other is going to be, uh, I had investigations for, uh, SIG, uh, SIG PR uh, is going to be trying to justify its existence, as is the committee um, and the Congressional Oversight Commission, which just means um, all of them are teaming with the SEC, DOJ. Uh, it just means that there's going to be increased scrutiny on everything having to do with sim stimulus. Uh, and so anything that you have there, you need to button down, have the story, uh, and know what needs to be told. We've already touched on, on insider trading and MNPI. Uh, you know, I know there's the Aries management matter out there, Matt, but I think maybe we skip and jump to um, Reg FD a little bit, um, and and then you know maybe a touch on a couple of these other things. Matt, anything on this slide that you wanted to jump to most? Otherwise, I can touch on a few of the of the different areas. No, I mean I would just say very quickly on on MNPI and insider trading, which we talked about before. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Aries case. That's a, just a pure policies and procedures case. There was no insider trading in that case. There was not even definitively MNPI. They simply took issue with the way the investment advisor determined whether or not it had, had MNPI and the policies and procedures for doing that, like just asking people if they had MNPI rather than uh, and taking their word for it rather than actually digging deeper. So, so the SEC is really looking at policies and procedures and wants detailed policies and procedures with respect to that. Steph, I think we can talk about, you know, we can throw it back to you. Uh, Reg BI is, if anyone's dual had it out there, there certainly adds in a, a, reason, a care obligation of reasonable diligence, care, and skill. 
um, for any broker dealer, which is new and really comes from your world. So you guys should be pretty familiar with the fiduciary duty that's being essentially moved over to uh, broker dealers. Whistleblower program, June 4th, saw the $50 million payout. Um, and more than $500 million total to 83 separate uh, whistleblowers that since the program began in 2012. Um, disgorgement, the, the, the Supreme Court has come out with Kokesh and Lou in, in disgorgement cases, which are all pretty well covered out there. And I think with that, Stephanie, anyone who wants to talk to us about any of those, and those all have been the subject of their own uh, entire panels, uh, I think you know you should uh, you should feel free to contact us, and we're happy to chat about that. As you can see from this panel, I'm happy to chat about anything for as long as you guys would like to. Otherwise, Steph, <laughs> why don't we throw it back to you? Yeah, kindred, your kindred spirit. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I'm sorry we had to breeze through that. I will just say one other thing on whistleblowers. Um, you know, the SEC is doing everything possible including somewhat advertising the high uh, awards that they are playing, paying in order to bring whistleblowers out more and more. I think in Stephanie Evakian's speech, she said this past year or since COVID, they've had 13,000 calls. Um, so there's a mighty incentive for people who know of problems within organizations uh, to blow the whistle. I, I think it's disloyal when they do it prior to trying to do the best they can to fix up a problem. Um, I think it's appropriate when they've tried to do that and there are potatoes in the ears of upper management. Um, those are my two cents worth. So, and for my final words, uh, throughout this program, each of the um, particular panels, I have shared a few of these amazing results of Scrabble experts who got together and said, well, we're all at home, so let's do something interesting. And they shared among themselves uh, a number of words or phrases. And the rules were you had to re-scramble but use every single letter in the original and come up with something else. Um, so for my final three, if you've been on these panels, you might want to write this down because it's truly amazing. <laughs> they took snooze alarms and when they re-scrambled came up with a laugh, no more Z's. They took 11 plus 2, re-scrambled the letters and came up with 12 plus 1. And what they say is the piece de resistance. I don't happen to agree with this because uh, she's really wonderful. They took mother-in-law, and the result of re-scrambling mother-in-law was woman Hitler. I'm just saying, I don't feel that way about my mother-in-law, but I found these scrabbled, scrambled words to be really amazing. If anybody wants the full set of them, um, please email me and come back next week for our final IMU, which is our ethics panel. We hope we'll be able to get ethics credits to those who come. And I and, and lest I need to uh, entice you more in my Scheherazade thousand and one night uh, methodology, I've saved my most interesting and funny material for the end of the last panel. Everyone stay well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take good care. Thank you on the panel. It was terrific. Bye-bye.